Good morning. If you've had a child in the last 10 years, particularly a daughter, uh, you are familiar with a young woman named Elsa. And Elsa uh, has a really famous song that I'm not going to sing because I don't want it in any of our brains. But there's a second movie where she sings another song that I think they thought was going to be just as popular, and it was not. But it definitely means something for us today. She sings out very loudly into the unknown, like over and over and over again. And it starts off with a little bit of trepidation on her part because she doesn't want to leave her quiet little life that she has now being queen of a country with her anthropomorphic snowman friend. (laughs) But then as the song goes on, she wants to go on this adventure. She feels this call to leave and to journey out into the unknown. And I think that is a bunch of bull. (laughs) Because I don't know about you, but the unknown terrifies me. I don't even like changing clothes, much less changing anything else. The unknown is horrifying. There's so many things that we don't know that are so haunting. Why do you think, as a people, we send probes out into space, into distant places that we can't even reach yet, so we can know what's out there? Why do you think we plumb the depths of the ocean? Why do you think we dig in the dirt for fossils? Because we don't like the unknown. We want to know. And when we don't know something, it scares us. How many of you, just in your own personal life, when you're home by yourself, every light is on? Because you're scared of the dark. You're like a 40-something you're on, and you're like, "This this is how I live, as a beacon to everyone in space. Or you have apps on your phone that keeps track of where your kids are based on where their phone is. You can't do anything about it, but you at least know where they are. Your phone says you're not at Andy's like you said you were going to be. Yeah, I left my phone in my friend's car. That's how it wound up in Mexico. (laughs) We are so ignorant, and we hate it. In fact, we would rather be called stupid than ignorant. Ignorance is like the worst cut down you can give somebody in today's world. Because we're so information driven, we can know so much, that to be ignorant just implies a, a sense of laziness, carelessness. We don't want to be ignorant. We're afraid of the unknown. Well, there's a whole lot out there that we can't know. But what I want us to talk about today are three things that we can know, particularly about the God that we worship. We're in Genesis chapter 43, and we're continuing on in our stuck series. At this point, we might be stuck in our story of Joseph. And we're going to get three things that we can know about our God from this story. And the first is, we can know God's character. We can know God's character. Verse 1 of chapter 43 says this, Now the famine was severe in the land, and when they had eaten the grain that they had brought from Egypt, their father said to them, Go again and buy us a little food. But Judah said to him, the man solemnly warned us, that's Joseph, by the way, is the man, saying, you shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. If you will send our brother with us, we will go down and buy you food. But if you will not send him, we will not go down. For the man said to us, you shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. And Israel said, why did you treat me so badly as to tell the man that you had another brother? And they replied, the man questioned us carefully about ourselves and our kindred, saying, is your father still alive? Do you have another brother? What we told him was an answer to these questions. Could we in any way know that he would say, bring your brother down? And Judah said to Israel, his father, send the boy with me, and we will arise and go that we may live and not die, both we and you and also our little ones. I will be a pledge of his safety. From my hand you shall require him. If I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, then let me bear the blame forever. If we had not delayed, we would have now have returned twice. God, Judah sounds like such a dad right there. We'd already been done twice now if we'd hurry up and gotten the road. Then their father Israel said to them, if it must be so, then do this. Take some of the choice fruits of the land in your bags and carry a present down to the man, a little balm and a little honey, gum, myrrh, pistachio nuts and almonds. Take double the money with you. Carry back with you the money that was returned in the mouth of your sacks. Perhaps it was an oversight. Take also your brother and arise. Go again to the man. May God Almighty, this is an important verse, may God Almighty grant you mercy before the man and may he send back your brother and Benjamin and as for me, if I am bereaved of my children, 
I am bereaved. This story up to this point is rife with ignorance. These men do not know how long the famine is supposed to last. We know because we've, had, uh, we've been able to read the narrative between Pharaoh and Joseph, but they don't know. They don't know that it's supposed to go on for seven years and we're only in year two. They don't know how they're gonna be received by this man that they don't know is, his bro- is their brother. They don't know if they're gonna be happy, sad. They don't know if they're gonna be held responsible for the money that came back with them the last time they took a trip down. They don't know if Simeon is alive, if he's dead. It's not like they've been getting letters from him over the course of these months that they've been gone. They don't know what's gonna happen to them when they get there. They don't know if they're gonna be well received, if Benjamin is have to be exchanged for Simeon. They don't know. And this sense of ignorance has paralyzed them And the only thing that's really shaken them out of this paralysis is survival. Finally, Jacob comes to him and says, you guys got to go buy us some food. We're not going to make it. And they're like, dad, we'd love to, but we have a problem. The man said, we couldn't go back unless we bring our brother with us. And you're not willing to send him. You have to send him back. And Judah, Judah has a really great line of argument here. He says, look, dad, this is the way it's going to be. Either A, you risk Benjamin and possibly get him back or you don't and you lose all of us, including Benjamin, because we're all going to die if we stay here. And there's something about this that that maybe gets Jacob in, in motion a little bit because then Judah says, look, you can trust me with him. You can trust me with the boy. This is the beginning, maybe not the beginning, but this is, this is a high point in Judah's change from being sort of this self-centered, hey, let's sell our brother into slavery to being selfless. It culminates in in the very end of the story where Judah becomes this sort of Christ-like figure willing to sacrifice himself. But this is kind of what's going on in the story. And something about this conversation moves Jacob into action. He brings that scheming brain of his that we always have seen so far. It kind of comes out of mothballs and he's like, hey, I got an idea. Let's grease the treads of you uh, being received by Pharaoh. Let's get you some presents for him. Let's bring double the money so you can pay them back if you need to. I'm gonna make this as smooth and as easy as possible for you and bring your brother Judah I'm going to trust you. I'm going to trust that it's going to be fine. So there's a lot of unknowns here, a lot of unknowns. But Jacob does something that all of us have done when we face the unknowns as well. He tries to control everything that he possibly can control. That's well within his sphere of control. He controls everything he can. And this is something we do as well. He's he's evaluating every possible outcome. He's thinking about every pathway and he's like, maybe this has happened. Maybe it was an oversight. So we need to have uh, maybe some money for you guys. We need to do this. We need to do that. He's trying to control as much as he can. And we do the same. We, we, We plan, we cipher, we think, we diversify, we scheme, we plot. Maybe not the scheming and plotting, but for the whole, for the most part, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with looking at a situation and seeing the parts where you can engage with it, you can manipulate it, you can work on it. That's not, uh, it kind of gets a negative rap in our our evangelical church culture of like, oh, you got to let go and let God. I mean, there's some truth there, I guess. But God also gave you this miraculous little thing called a brain. And he expects you to use it. One of the ways in which he provides for you is he gives you a brain. We, every Friday in our dwell readings, we're reading the book of Proverbs. Proverbs are all about using your brain. They're like, hey, the ant works really hard to get ready for winter. Maybe you should too. It's not like, oh, the ant waits for God to provide things during the winter for him. And if you don't, you're a faithless, worthless nothing. But the problem that we make, and one that Jacob has not made or did not make in this instance, is we try to go outside of the things that we can control to things that we cannot control. We start expanding, we start going, our reach starts getting longer and longer and longer. I do this as well. There's a correlation between ignorance and doing this. Because the more that we don't know, the more we get scared. The more blanks we have to fill in, the more we get scared. And the more scared we get, the more we try to control. All of us do this. 
right? When there's something that we try to control people, how many of us use guilt, manipulation? If you have kids, I know you use bribery. If you will please just behave, I will give you up to half my kingdom. <laughs> if you will just get through this doctor's appointment. Little does the kid know they're gonna inherit half your kingdom anyway. But he's not up on you know, inheritance law, so ha, joke's on him. We try to manipulate our own brain sometimes. We're like, ah, oh, I just need to think about this differently. And we think that, think of that. We try to manipulate God. We try to control him. Got to go to church. I pray. I read my Bible. I do my dwell readings. I give. So God, you know, so you're, you, we have an agreement here. You might not say it in so many words, but very often we don't do the things, the spiritual disciplines to show God we love him. We do it to make sure that God feels inclined to help us. And this shows that we're not wise at all. It shows that we are ignorant of God's character. If you knew God's character, if you were wise, you would know not only do you not need to manipulate him, but you can't manipulate him. Jacob, in, in verse 14, he says, may God Almighty grant you mercy before the man, and may he send back your other brother and Benjamin, and as for me, if I'm bereaved of my children, I'm bereaved. Inside that sentence, or a couple sentences, that verse, there are four things that are revealed about God's character that I want us to talk about today that we can trust. One is Jacob says, may. May. This is an expression that he makes to Judah, but it's functionally a prayer. He's saying, may God, God, may you please grant them success on this journey. May you watch over them. And this shows us something about God. God wants to be asked things. He wants to be asked things. He wants to be implored. He wants to be entreated. He wants you to make requests of him. I know we kind of, again, talk about, oh, well, you shouldn't treat God like he's this Santa Claus in the sky. Okay, yeah, sure. But you should treat him like someone who wants to be asked things. Secondly, he says, he calls him the Lord Almighty. This is only the fourth time Almighty has appeared in scripture so far. The other three times it has appeared in relation to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and them flourishing, them being fruitful. And so what I think Jacob is saying here is, may God make your journey fruitful, make it, make, make it worth your while. We have a God who is able to do the things we ask. So when we ask him for things, he's not a God that's like, oh man, like a counselor. He's like, oh, that's, that's really interesting that you have that request. You know, like, hey, maybe we can work on some strategies to help you deal with that. That's not how God is. God hears and then he is able to do something about it. Prayer is not this useless exercise. It's not just me trying to vent Prayer can be effective. Why? Because the Almighty is the one who receives it, the one who's able to do anything. The next thing he says is, may God grant you mercy. This word mercy is really interesting because it's, it's a, a rare word for the word mercy. Uh, it actually is the word that's used to describe brotherly affection. And so what Jacob is saying, and he doesn't realize he's saying, I imagine the narrator knows this, is he's saying, may the, may the man who's in charge of all this, who we know to be Joseph, may he look on you with brotherly compassion. Spoilers, it's his brother. It's a great little word. God wants to be merciful to you. So when you go to God with your request that he's able to answer, he doesn't look at you and he's like, here we go again. Blessing the food. Dang, every time. Or here he is again asking for his kids to be healthy and well. God. Or here she is again. She's got a pain in her leg. I'm so tired of hearing about this. No. God is incredibly merciful. Incredibly, he longs to pour that grace out, to pour that mercy out on you, to receive you with open arms, to talk to you again and again and again with this compassion, this affection. It's part of his character. It's who he is. It's who he is. And then the last thing he says is, if I'm bereaved of my children, I'm bereaved, which sounds really fatalistic. He's like, meh, whatever happens, happens. No, that's not what's going on. What he's doing is he's saying, I have done everything I can. I, I have reached the end 
of my ability to influence this situation. The rest is up to the Lord. This is a trust of faith in the sovereignty of God. God is in control of everything. Everything that happens either is caused by God or is allowed to happen by God. God is in charge. Because he is sovereignly in control of all things, he's the perfect person that we can trust. Now, any four of these things separated from the others can be bad or manipulated or weird, but all four of them together make an incredibly wonderful God that you can go to and appeal to when you are faced with your fears of things that are unknown, things that you're scared of, things that you're worried about, the, the, the things you're ignorant of. So often we run to learn more. Oh, uh, what, what happens if this happens? I'm gonna go research it and I'll find out. I've got a pain in my leg, WebMDB. WebMB, WebMD, WebMD, that was it. I went with IMDB there at the end. Sorry, I like movies. I'm gonna research that, I'm gonna know some more and then I'll know that the pain in my leg is either it's a cold or it's cancer, either one. You can go to your God. You can turn to him. And this tells us something else about him that we can know. We can know his provision. We can know God's provision. Look at verse 16. When Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he said to the steward of his house, that's basically his butler, bring the men into the house and slaughter an animal and make ready for the men are to dine with me at noon. The man did as Joseph told him and brought the men to Joseph's house. And the men were afraid because they were brought to Joseph's house. And they said, it is because of the money which was replaced in our sacks the first time that we were brought in so that he may assault us and fall upon us to make us servants and seize our donkeys. So they went up to the steward of Joseph's house and spoke with him at the door of the house. And he said, oh my Lord, we came down the first time to buy food. And when we came to the lodging place, we opened our sacks and there was each man's money in the mouth of a sack, our money in full weight. So we have brought it again with us and we have brought other money down with us to buy food. We do not know who put our money in our sacks. I imagine that, that they were gonna keep talking. I, I think this is just like word vomit, like at this point. And the steward, I think, interrupts them and says, peace to you, do not be afraid. Your God and the God of your father has put treasure in your sacks for you. I received your money. Then he brought Simeon out to them. So Joseph sees his brothers coming. He sees that Benjamin maybe is with them. Looks like he's with them. And so he, he decides to have a, a dinner, a lunch at his house. And this is so weird, especially for the, the 10 brothers because there are 11 brothers. They're sitting here walking, walking through and they're like, so wait, he wants us to come over? Like for a cookout? Like imagine being, uh, getting a jury summons and the judge is like, you know what? This is cool. Like, why don't we just take this to my place? Like we can do the whole courtroom there. This is great. I got, I got a, a, a big green egg where I can put some meat on. It's going to be great. Yeah, let's do it. It's very odd. And so they get really nervous about this. They start freaking out. And you can tell they're freaking out because what do they think is going to happen? He's going to fall on us. He's going to assault us. And he's going to take our donkeys. Not the donkeys. <sighs> What's going to happen to the donkeys? This is one of those things when you are afraid of something. When you're faced with this like ignorant, uh, the, the unknown, you start playing out scenarios in your head, right? Of like how badly things can go. And you get to the point of irrationality because think about it. These men can't, isn't Joseph like a big enough cheese in Pharaoh that, or in, in Egypt that he could just like, whatever harm he was gonna do to them at his house, he could have just done at his office, right? Like nobody's gonna stop him, right? But they've got like this weird, I don't know, sense of, of fear. And that's what anxiety does to you. That's what worry and ignorance does to you. And so they start kind of confessing all this stuff to the steward. Like, hey, we didn't know, we didn't know what was going on. And you kind of get this idea that they're just talking, talking, talking. And then finally, the steward says two things that calms them down. First thing he says is, look, peace to you, don't worry. He says very practically, look man, like my accounts are good, you're fine. And then the second thing he says is he points them to God. He says the, your God and the God of your fathers has taken care of you. Basically what he's saying here is like, why are you so worried about being cared for when you have a God that is so gracious to you he magically puts money in your sacks? 
Why are you freaking out? You have a God that cares for you, that loves you. There's a common relationship between anxiety and the unknown that detracts us from God's provision. When we're confronted with the unknown, we tend to think about those things that might happen. We focus on all the potential things that could go wrong. We start filling in the blanks. And sometimes, particularly in things that we're really worried about, this can take the form of like what's called intrusive thoughts. And so if you have... There, it's really particular to people that struggle with anxiety uh, chronically, but it can also just happen to anybody. So if you're really worried about your health, maybe you have a health scare at some point in your life, and so you're really sensitive about other things like that, and so you start feeling a pain somewhere, you start having a similar situation to something you had happen before, and you're like, oh no, here we go again. And boom, 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 you start, you start going, you start spiraling. Or if you're constantly worried about being fired or being released from your job because you maybe you've been laid off a couple times, you're like, oh, it's always just about to happen. It's about to happen. And so you're just always like thinking about what you'll do. You know, you've got like money under the mattress, under the couch, under the guinea pig. You're just like everywhere. Uh, I don't have money under my guinea pig, just in case. I do have a guinea pig, but I don't want anybody to break into my house and be like, it's under the guinea pig. <laughs> we do this. And we start thinking about all these ways that we can back things up and, and, and protect ourselves. Or maybe you're worried about people leaving you. And so you are constantly apologizing. You're constantly trying to make sure everything's okay. And then they're like, hey, you can stop apologizing. And you're like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I said I'm sorry. You know, and we just kind of keep apologizing. And this can happen to anybody. But the connection with God's provision is simply this. We do not trust God to provide for us. Because we don't recognize that he's provided for us in the past. We think all the things that we have are things that we've gained on our own. And so if we lose those things, I've got to go through all the hard work of getting those things again. And what you don't realize is God is the one who brought those into your life. And just like Job says, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. He can do those things. And you might sit there. I know there's some of you in this room. They're like, well, Travis, like I understand like God has provided some things, but like I work really hard. I work like 80 hours a week and I am the one who made myself what I am today. And I understand God provides some, but like I contribute some too. Okay, let's talk about your breakfast. Let's talk about breakfast. Let's assume for the sake, how many of you had cereal this morning? Wow, okay, nobody had cereal? <laughs> Thank you. Couple of people. I was going to, but I was, I was late. Nobody, eats, does anybody eat cereal anymore? Is the cereal industry in trouble? This is news to me. Thank you, Jackson. Appreciate it. I eat Fruit Loops. Fruit Loops. Right on. Okay, so, so assuming cereal, uh, did you grow the grain that, that you, you harvested to, to make into cereal? No, you did not. Did you uh, make the cardboard box that the grain and the bran goes in? No, you did not. Did you pave the roads that the trucks used? to go down to the store? Did you build the store? Did you check out the grocery? Yes, you probably did because they have these self-checkout things. But that's neither here nor there. Did you design the like thing that you scan or tap your car? Again, some of you may did, but, but in the grand scheme of things, you have done very little to provide for your breakfast. The most credit we can give you is that you opened the box. It's, it's, it's insane. That we sit here and we think that we provide for ourselves. When if every single grocery store closed tomorrow, most of us would be in a famine because we can't grow anything. I, I watched a, a YouTube video the other day of a guy growing a pineapple and I was like, why are you doing this? Just go to the store. There's pineapples there. And they're big and great. Jesus says that you can't change one color of hair on your head by worrying about it. We need regular, daily, moment by moment reminders of God's provision for us in our lives because we are so quick to forget. In your dwell journal, you have a, a section that says here, so there's like, what is, what is God saying? What are, we, what are we hearing from God? I would encourage you over the next week to just write in one sentence maybe about, hey, this is, this is what God's provided for me. And don't make it like something big and abstract, like God's provided me with a beautiful sunrise. Okay. Make it something really practical and concrete, something boring. 
God has provided me with uh, just a, a great uh, lunch today. And here's all the people that went involved in making that or the safety that I have in my car. I can drive down the road not worrying about getting T-boned at 35 miles an hour and being flung from my vehicle because I have all these safety features. That's God's provision. So God offers us his character. We can know his character. We can know his provision. We can experience it, but we can also know his grace. We can know God's grace. Let's finish up by looking at verse 26. When Joseph came home, they brought into the house to him uh, the present that they had with them and bowed down to him to the ground. And he inquired about their welfare and said, is your father well, the old man of whom you spoke? Is he still alive? They said, your servant, our father is well. He's still alive. And they bowed their heads and prostrated themselves. And he lifted up his eyes and saw his brother Benjamin, his mother's son, and said, is this your youngest brother of whom you spoke to me? God be gracious to you, my son. And then Joseph hurried out, for his compassion grew warm for his brother. And he sought a place to weep. And he entered his chamber and wept there. Then he washed his face and came out. And controlling himself, he said, serve the food. And they served him by himself and them by themselves and the Egyptians who ate with him by themselves because the Egyptians could not eat with the Hebrews for that is an abomination to the Egyptians. And they sat before him, the firstborn according to his birthright and the youngest according to his youth. And the men looked at one another in amazement. Portions were taken to them from Joseph's table, but Benjamin's portion was five times as, many of the, as much as any of theirs. And they drank and were merry with him. So Joseph shows up to lunch and they start to eat. After he asks some questions, he says, hey, is, your, is, your, is this the brother? Is your father still alive? And then he leaves. He leaves because he, he gets full of emotion. And my guess is he gets emotional because he sees that Benjamin really is in good health. That his brothers have not treated Benjamin the way they've treated him. It, it, we're coming to the, the, the end of him discerning whether or not his brothers have changed. And it looks like they have. There's one other test he's going to do later on. But the desire to reveal himself at this point is very great. After he gets a hold of himself, he comes back and they start to eat and it seems pretty awkward, right? Like, hey, come have lunch with me. I'm gonna sit way over here and you guys sit way over there. It'd be a great time. But they seem to have a really good time. But two things blow the minds of, of the brothers. One, they get seated in like order of birth, right? So the oldest sits here and then so on and so forth, all the way down to Benjamin. And I don't know what probability is on this, I didn't look it up, but the probability has gotta be really high. Or sorry, really low, low? Uh, again, not math person. Uh, the probability has gotta be low that this would just happen randomly. So they're blown away that somebody was able to do this. And it's not like you could look at the brothers. It's not like one's 10, one's eight, one's six. You know, with kids, you can kind of eyeball it, except for like the one six-year-old that's like six feet tall. And they're like grown and shaving. And you're like, what happened to you? That blows their mind. They're absolutely blown away. But then Benjamin starts getting like five times as much as anybody else. Joseph starts treating Benjamin like the grandma that, that sees the kid coming home from college for the first time. He's like, you need more mashed potatoes. And she's, he's like, no, I don't. I'm really okay. Just keeps feeding him over and over and over again. This is a far cry from where we started, isn't it? Remember they were afraid they were going to lose their donkeys. And now they're being fed, they're celebrating. And it even says, look, the last, the last verse. And they drank and were merry with him. By the way, there's a note in my Bible that says merry could mean intoxicated. <laughs> this is a par T. This is like going out one day, just like running errands. And then you wind up meeting Keanu Reeves and you spend the rest of your day hanging out with Keanu Reeves. And it's like the best story you can never tell in church <laughs> because you ran into Keanu Reeves. Again, that's who I would want to hang out with. I think he seems fun. Maybe it's somebody else for you. This is completely unexpected and it's completely undeserved. Let me remind you who is at this dinner party. These 11 brothers, more like 10 of them are the ones that are really bad. One of them uh, slept with his father's wife. Another two of them uh, took revenge on an entire village and killed a whole bunch of people. Uh, another one uh, was looking to um, find a prostitute and wound up finding his daughter-in-law instead. 
And the other ones don't get special distinction of how terrible they are, but they all trafficked their brother into slavery. These are all horrible human beings, unequivocally. And the one person that they have done all this stuff to, this sin, this brokenness, this evil that they have done, the person that took the brunt of most of it, he's there. And they don't know it. And what's even better, he has the power to do something about it. How many of us, if you had the power for just one day to get back at all the people who did you wrong, who, who maybe bullied you in school, if you could just make them just, how many of us would take it? I know, look, you've seen the videos of courtrooms when the sentence is handed down on somebody. Maybe you've been in a courtroom, maybe you're a lawyer, you've seen it. And the sentence is handed down on a guy convicted of murder. And you see their face fall and they start to grieve because they're being told, you're never gonna get out of prison. The sentence hits them. And there's a part of us that just is like, yeah, you're finally getting what you deserve. Absolutely. Or you're on the highway and somebody goes speeding past you and you're like, man, I really hope that guy gets a ticket. And then you come over the next rise and they've been pulled over. And you're like, yeah, vengeance, and I got to see it. This is great. There's a part of us that really wants Joseph to absolutely lay into his brothers because there's a part of us that wants to see everybody get exactly what they deserve with one exception. I don't want it to happen to me. I don't want it to happen to me. I don't want to get exactly what I deserve. There's extenuating circumstances you don't understand. I, 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 please give me some grace. Give me some mercy. I'm so sorry. Joseph doesn't do it. Joseph does something completely different. He invites them over for feasting and for a celebration. And I hope you see the picture that is God's grace here. Because we are the ten brothers who deserve to be absolutely obliterated. We have followed idols, which the Bible calls spiritual adultery. We have rather been with anything else than our relationship with the Lord. We've basically sold our relationship with the Lord into slavery so that we could have other things that we wanted. We've hated people in our heart, which is, a, is murder according to Jesus. And when you murder somebody, that is an attack on the image of God, which is an attack on God himself. Everything that we have ever done wrong, we have done it to Jesus Christ. And he finds himself in the exact same position that Joseph is in. He is simultaneously the, the, the primary victim of our crimes. And he is the one who's perfectly capable of exacting whatever horrible revenge you can come up with. Jesus can do it. But he doesn't, and do you know why? because he took it out on himself. He took revenge on himself. The justice that we deserve, he took out on himself. God sends his son so that he can offer us. The reason why Jesus dies on the cross, why he is buried, why he is resurrected, is so that God can offer us feasting and merriment, not at tables across the room because it's an abomination, but so that we can be intimately eating at the same table and enjoying fellowship with the God who made us, the God who loves us, and the God who sacrificed to bring us. The only thing that God has that he wants is a relationship with you. That's the only thing he doesn't have that he wants. And maybe up to this point you have been ignorant of that fact, or maybe spiritually you're ignorant of that fact. You've known it cognitively, but it's never really hit home. the one person who has more right than anybody else in the world to be furious with you and to take it out of your hide took it out of himself. And the only thing he has to offer you now is grace and forgiveness and mercy if you will just take it. If you'll just take it. If you will trust in his character. If you'll trust in his provision. Christ, by the way, is a provision for our sin. We think of provision as food and drink. This is you'll trust in his grace. I understand that for some of you, there might be this fear of stepping out in faith to the Lord. What am I going to have to leave behind? What's my life going to look like if I give my life to Christ? What's my life going to look like if I give my life to Christ in this one area? This is, this is an area I've kind of held back. 
You're a little like Elsa. You're looking out into the unknown. And I hope that this morning when we started, maybe there's trepidation of the unknown of following Christ. But as we've walked through who he is and what we can know about him, you'll find not trepidation, but a sense of excitement and joy at following in the one who loves you so much. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity that we have today to go with you, to walk out of here different, to venture out into the unknown of a life that's sovereignly guided and and directed by you. Lord, I pray that each person here would trust who you are, who you've revealed yourself to be, would trust you to provide for us, Lord, as we go. And that above all else, we trust in your grace that you so freely offer to us. That's free for us. And it wasn't free for you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I pray all this in your name. Amen.